Call the meeting to order, please. This is the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, January 16, 2020. Our first one of the year. Please call the roll. President Sells. Here. Trustee Peters. Here. Trustee Galagos. Here. Trustee Giza. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Mars. Here. Also present, Village Clerk Haley. Thank you very much. If you'll join us for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and welcome to everyone who is with us here this evening and those of you watching at home. If you are here and you'd like to address the board at any time, I just ask that you be recognized by the president and that you make your comments from the podium so that the folks at home can hear and see what you have to say. You're welcome to give your comments during public comment, which is next, or if you would rather wait until a particular agenda item is called, you're welcome to give your thoughts and comments at that time as well. So first up is public comment. Would anyone would like to address the board at this time? Mr. Jacobs. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tom Jacobs. I live at 104 Scottswood Road, and I'm here in my role as a citizen. It has nothing to do with the high school. Um, I saw on the agenda that there is a topic being discussed that is um, gravel driveways. And <clears throat> while I have to say that I don't know too many of the details of the specific application, I would like to uh, make a recommendation that the board consider this for approval. Uh, I say this in my role as an architect and planner and somebody who's very concerned for the well-being of future generations. I also see this in the context of the leadership of the Village of Riverside and I commend this board and prior boards for the work they have done on parking lots uh, in the village and now by the train station that have permeable paving. This is a very uh, important feature that benefits the environment and all the people that reside here. And so uh, specifically, I think gravel driveways are, uh, they're an attractive feature. They can be maintained properly. I think they're, they deserve uh, uh, real consideration in their own rights, but also in order to do them uh, done really properly is basically a way where the uh, gravel is set in a in some sort of plastic frequently recycled grid structure over top of a root barrier and that basically makes a, a gravel driveway permeable to uh, rainwater also meaning that the rain rather than being shed and then having to be treated and so forth uh, goes into the sewer and then in a big plant that takes a lot of energy the rainwater basically can infiltrate directly into the ground and recharge aquifers. So having said all of this, I think it's a great idea. I'm very excited to see uh, this happening in the village or that people apply for things like that. And it, in my opinion, it fits right into this, as I said before, uh, into the idea of Riverside as a leader on, behavior, on environmental issues. And I'm thrilled to see that. And I would recommend to all of you to consider it seriously and, uh, and, and approve it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anyone else at this time? Hearing none, we'll move on to reports of village officers. First up is the village president report. And I'm very happy to have a motion to appoint Amy Jaksik to the Economic Development Commission to fill a vacancy, a term to expire May 2020. Uh, you have your, her application before you. The only thing that surprises me is that she still has time to actually do this with everything else she's already doing. But uh, she's uh, been an ardent volunteer for our community for many years. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for the village to have her in that role. So I'd ask for a motion and a second to approve Ms. Jackson to the EEC. I'll make a motion. And Ms. I will make that second. Second by Mr. Gallagos. Any conversation, debate? Please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Gisa. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Polly. Aye. The motion carries, and I see that we have Ms. Jackson here with us this evening. If you'd step up, and uh, Ms. Haley, if you'll do the honors. Sorry, 
just need you to raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Amy Jaksik, do solemnly swear. I, Amy Jaksik, do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And that I will faithfully perform the duties. And that I will faithfully perform the duties. Of the Office of Economic Development Commissioner of the Office of Economic Development Con Commissioner for the Village of Riverside, Illinois. For the Village of Riverside, Illinois. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. Next up is a motion to authorize the creation of the 2020 Census Complete Count Ad Hoc Committee uh, and the hosting of an initial informational organizational meeting. This arises out of the village's dedication to try to get as full a count during the upcoming census as possible. Uh, we've, we've spoken about the importance of the census in the past, but just to reiterate a couple, a couple facts. Uh, in terms of federal funding, the census numbers are tied directly to federal funding. It's estimated that for every person undercounted in the state of Illinois, the state of Illinois will lose $1,400 a year in federal funding over the course, the lifetime of the census, which is 10 years. The major undercounted populations that we're going to be trying to reach in Riverside and that have traditionally been the, the ones most undercounted have been minority populations, children under the age of five, it's very important for parents to remember that if your child is born before April 1st, 2020, um, that little boy or girl counts as part of the census. Uh, also, the, uh, the minority population and people living in extended households are notoriously undercounted. So the purpose of this committee is to try to get together uh, residents and business owners, leaders of our faith-based organizations, uh, that kind of thing to assist the village in trying to make sure we get as full a count as possible. Um, so with that said, I would ask for a motion and second to uh, create the 2020 Census Count Ad Hoc Committee. I will make that motion. Mr. Gallagher. Second. By Ms. Peters. Any further discussion? Um, just to fill it out a little bit further, uh, Trustee Evans and I will be the board liaisons to the committee. Uh, Ms. Haley, the village clerk, will be the staff liaison to the committee. And then we have quite a number of community uh, volunteers that we have invited to our first meeting, which will be on January 22nd. Um, if you're interested in assisting us in this effort, uh, you can contact me through the village email, and I will put you on the list to, to, to help get this done. So with that, I'd ask for you to call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Jesus. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all I have. Ms. Francis. I have two items this evening. Um, the first item is I want to take a moment um, to introduce the latest Aye. member of the Village's team. Um, it's management analyst, Will Bowman. Will, if you don't mind, kind of stepping up to the podium. Thank you. Um, Will will be handling front counter <coughs> operations and related activities for our building and community development department. Additionally, he will be assisting Director Apt with the Economic Development Commission, Preservation Commission, and Planning and Zoning Commission. Will received his Bachelor of Arts from Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, where he majored in environmental studies and minored in anthropology and sociology. He is currently completing his coursework for his master's in urban planning and policy from the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs. He has received a certification in geospatial analysis and visualization. He previously completed an internship at the American Planning Association and worked for the Illinois Sustainability Technology Center. And so you will be seeing Will present at many of our commission meetings and potentially some of our board meetings as well. Excellent. Welcome. We're glad to have you with us. Happy to be here. And the second item that I wanted to provide a little bit more information slash update on is within the packet on the consent agenda is the update on the December financials. Um, currently, um, once you back out our unassigned 
um, fund balance transfer that we did within fiscal year 2019 for capital items. Um, we're estimating a surplus of around 239,000, but this is very preliminary. So it's important to note that we're still estimating a modest surplus for 2019. However, there are still revenues and expenditures that need to be posted for fiscal year 2019. So, thank you. Thank you. Next up is the approval of the consent agenda on the agenda this evening, and I regret to say it's a lengthy one, so bear with me. Uh, ratify the voucher list of bills for December 19, 2019 and January 2, 2020. Approve the voucher list of bills January 16, 2020. Approve the Village Board of Trustees regular meeting minutes of December 5, 2019. Review and file the following, the EDC Commission meeting minutes of September 12, 2019. Planning and Zoning Commission meeting minutes of November 25, 2019. The uh, Community Development Finance Fire and Police Department November and December 2019 reports, a motion approving revisions to the BART Park banner policy, a motion approving a revised project pro program information form for the train station roof replacement project, a motion to authorize termination of an automated traffic law enforcement agreement with Safe Speed LLC, resolution appointing certain chief executives, administrator managers, and members of the village board city council to the position of director and alternate director of the West Cook County Solid Waste Agency. A resolution, resolution authorizing the village manager to execute a contract with D. Ryan Tree and Landscape Service in the amount not to exceed $40,000 for the 2020 <coughs> cyclic tree trimming services. A resolution authorizing the village manager to execute a contract with D. Ryan Tree and Landscape Service in the amount not to exceed $40,000 for 2020 tree and stump removal and emergency storm damage response. An ordinance to provide for non-participation of the Village of Riverside in certain assessment relief property, I'm sorry, <coughs> assessment relief provided by the property tax code for historic buildings and for certain resident structures located within the Riverside Landscape Architectural District. A resolution of the Village of Riverside waiving competitive bidding and authorizing the village manager to issue a purchase order to Fox Valley Fire and Safety for replacement of Keltron server and upgrade to fire alarm monitoring system in an amount not to exceed $36,500. And lastly, a resolution waiving competitive bidding and authorizing the village manager to enter into various purchase orders. Does anyone need anything removed for discussion? Hearing none, I'd ask for a motion and a second to approve. So moved. By Mr. Galagos. Second. And Mr. Gisa, please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Gisa. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Powell. Aye. Motion carries. Next up are reports of departments, commissions, and trustee liaisons. Are there any liaison reports this evening? Hearing none, we'll move on to departments. First is an informational update on garages and driveways ad hoc committee review of staff zoning ordinance modification recommendations. Director Bailey. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm the staff liaison to the garage and driveways ad hoc committee. I'd like to start off with a little bit of background. Um, in 2018, the Village Board reviewed the Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation on zoning and other code amendments related to driveways and garages and had several concerns. The Board's concerns included nonconformities in that the trustees expressed concern about creating new nonconformities on existing houses and how many properties in the village the proposed amendments would impact. As far as feasibility and restrictiveness goes, board was concerned that the proposed tax amendments um, for uh, the proposed tax amendments related to feasibility and buildability um, they were concerned that they wanted to ensure that ve vehicles could actually maneuver in the garages and driveways built to the proposed specifications trustees also wanted to ensure the zoning ordinance encourages reuse rather than teardowns and finally as a uh, pertain to driveway aprons. The concern was that the driveway apron restrictions would be conducive to the village streets. At the December 6, 2018 Village Board meeting, the Board did not approve the proposed tax amendments due to these concerns. The Board asked staff to look into the, the matter further and provide an update at a future date of what could or should be updated. Consequently, this uh, staff made a recommendation to the Village Board 
uh, on these various items and the staff recommendations were not fully accepted, I would say, by the village board. The village board then elected to create an ad hoc garages and driveways committee to, in fact, uh, review and make recommendations regarding staff recommendations. Um, the ad hoc committee has met twice. Uh, they have uh, worked most of the way through these staff recommendations. I can touch base on them in uh, kind of a brief form. But um, the first one um, concerns the apron definition. This would be a driveway apron. There's not currently a, a definition for aprons in the municipal code. And these are, in fact, the public part of the driveway that's between the sidewalk and the curb. Staff recommendation was to add a new section to the municipal code that defines driveway aprons and to clarify that driveway aprons are considered separate from driveways. The ad hoc committee agreed with the staff recommendation. As far as flares versus radii, currently um, driveway aprons have a flare shape to them. They're narrow, narrower uh, where the driveway apron meets the sidewalk and a flare um, outward. Um, to where it meets the uh, driveway, meets the curb. Staff recommendation was to change the recommend, recommend uh, to change the, the flare, no. Staff recommendation was to change the apron design from the current flare, where the apron meets the curb, to a radius or curved uh, design with a maximum curb width, opening width. The committee did not occur with that recommendation and believe that, that this issue requires further investigation due to the, the concern that vehicle tires will drop off the edge of the driveway apron. As far as uh, setbacks and encroachments, uh, staff recommended removing encroachment restrictions. The committee agreed with the staff recommendation. Regarding shared and abutting driveways, the staff recommended amending the municipal code to address shared abutting driveways. And the committee concurred with that staff recommendation, but believes that there should be a section that addresses shared abutting driveways with a maximum curb cut to be determined by further investigation of the flare versus radii shape of the aprons. So in essence, they're tying those two things together. As far as the curb cut width goes, the staff recommended an increase from four, to five, from four to five feet and to establish a process where driveway apron variation from standard dimensions could be addressed. And this has to do with more geometry of how the driveway apron meets the potentially a curvilinear street. It doesn't necessarily happen that often, but this recommendation would establish a process um, for allowing some deviation from the standard specifications for driveways. And the committee agreed with that staff recommendation. As far as the front, uh, front facade measurements, and this is the front of a residence, um, how, and how that um, front facade is measured, what could be included in it. Um, we, the staff recommended that there be a clarification defining how front facades are measured. Again, that's an example of, uh, you would say that, uh, say chimneys, that there's an exter exterior chimney on the side of a house. The, the clarification would determine whether or not that could be included or should be included in a front facade measurement. And the committee concurred with the staff recommendation. Regarding nonconformity, staff recommended that no changes be made regarding uh, nonconforming driveways. <clears throat> the committee conferred with the staff recommendation and suggests that care be taken that the municipal code does not characterize existing driveways as nonconforming. That was the extent of the uh, committee action on the staff recommendations. Um, there's two more areas in the staff, two more items in the staff recommendations that uh, are still outstanding, and that's uh, driveway width and garage incentives or bonuses, or bonuses or incentives associated with garages. The, I'm corresponding with the committee chairperson right now. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to establish 
um, a third meeting in which should really be the final meeting of this ad hoc committee and deal with these last two items and um, you know, I think that will constitute the um, charge <coughs> or responsibility of the ad hoc committee. So you're, when do you think you'll be able to get the last meeting in? Well, I was hoping in January, I'm, as time is moving on a little bit, I would still like to get it finished by the end of January. But if not by the end of January, by the first part of February, I think for the most part, there's probably broad, cons one thing there's broad consensus on is for this committee to complete their work and be able to move this issue forward. Any other questions for? Just for the viewers at home, can you talk a little bit about the ad hoc committee itself and who's who's on the who's on the committee and what their backgrounds are? Well, the ad hoc committee was appointed by the village board. Um, the chairperson is Sandra Kaplan, who's the uh, I believe on the preservation commission. Uh, Charles Pipel, who's on the preservation commission, also Abby and Greg Randall, who are uh, I think architects at least in the community. I'm not sure that they're on a, on a public board. Um, Mike Foley, he's a former trustee who's also a builder, and uh, Scott Lumsden, who's a former uh, Village Board of Trustee member. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Next up is a report regarding staff review of lighting regulations in comparison to neighboring communities. Director Act. Thank you. Um, back in October, uh, we had a resident. Um, address the board regarding a concern about um, illumination, uh, specifically um, related to LED lights. He stated that our zoning ordinance does not reference modern LED lighting, and he believed that um, we should consider uh, discussing the impact of LED lighting in residential neighborhoods. Uh, the village board directed staff to review codes of area communities as it relates to illumination levels and LED lighting, and report back to the board. Um, so. Uh, the building inspector and I have reviewed illumination standards from other surrounding and comparable communities to see if their regulations differ significantly um, from the from Riverside's and whether or not they specifically address LED lights. Um, what we found, um, I included in your packet um, a list of the communities that we surveyed, um, but what we found was that none of our surrounding or comparable communities specifically address LED lights um, in their regulations. Uh, 10 of the 13 communities surveyed have a maximum illumination level um, at residential property lines, which are generally less than one foot candle, typically about 0.5 foot candles or less. Um, four of the communities have specific shielding requirements, and um, some of the communities actually provide even further um, shielding requirements where they get into cutoffs and how much the cutoffs need to be angles or measured from the street, um, things like that. So I did provide you with some kind of examples or illustrations of what a cutoff is and kind of what those look like. But basically, if something has a cutoff, it means it's not directing light uh, directly up. Um, something that has a full cutoff goes a little bit past that 180 line, so making sure that the light is not spilling, you know, uh, directly horizontally off of the light. And that's going to probably provide the most protection um, from kind of glare from like an LED or another light um, onto a neighboring uh, property. Um, our regulations are not substantially different from these other communities. However, there are some changes that the village could make to better prevent um, a nuisance situation in our residential areas. Some of these could be to add a maximum height limit for wall mounted or under soffit lighting. Um, something like um, that it shouldn't be mounted any higher than say 15 feet. Um, another one would be to add those specific cutoff and shielding requirements kind of like I mentioned. Um, some communities will have ones where if the cutoff is determined by whether or not you can see the light at a certain height measured at a property line. Others um, talk about the degree or angle of the cutoff um, for the light. So those are some options that the, the village could entertain. Um, I did provide you with the table, kind of showing what the other communities did. Um, if this is something that the village board would like to pursue, staff can incorporate addressing residential lighting into our zoning ordinance update that we should be uh, tackling this year. So what do you think, trustees? Would you like some of these things to be considered as code changes? Are you happy with the way things are? Is this for residential, business, all? What would the lighting be um, applicable to, or is that part of the process? That can be part of the process. Um, again, our 
our regulations have different illumination levels um, for residential property lines versus commercial property lines. However, the shielding requirement is, is still there. So if we do these changes, we could also have the shielding requirement apply to commercials, commercial properties. Um, and that, especially considering how many of our commercial properties, not that many of them have necessarily parking lots, um, but even for wall-mounted lights to have some sort of regulation, we could do that as well. Personally, I'm happy with the, the way things are. I think so. I don't see any change myself. I don't see any change to anything myself right now, but it's Peter's, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I could go either way. If we wanted to explore it further, I, I would, but I don't need, I don't have a, I don't see an ab absolute need to do so. I like this side of the room over here. I would like to look at it further, explore it. Especially um, the cutoff part. The cutoff, yeah. So we do. We have a neighbor that has really bright light. It doesn't bother me, but I can see how it would bother people, especially people who are sensitive about light at night. And the lights are getting much more powerful. Um, there's been more talk about how dark it is in town, um, even though it's been as dark since the beginning of time. But I just think as people become more aware of um, the darkness, we might see more people installing light and it might be a good idea for us to have these guidelines in place in advance. There's been a lot of change in the technology for lighting and I think we probably owe it to ourselves to look at it and update it. So I'm okay with you folks if we yeah. look into it a little bit more. Sure. Okay. Does that help? I can kind of add that to the list and see if uh, the professionals can provide a little bit more input into it as we delve into the, the zoning update. Thank you for the work you've already done on it. Thank, Thank you. you. Next up are ordinances and, ordinances and resolutions. Um, I'm going to take the last one first because it, it, it's an ordinance approving an expansion of an existing special use to allow for a classroom addition to uh, Blythe Park Elementary School. <coughs> Uh, Trustee Hannon, who is not here with us this evening, uh, would like to be present for that discussion. So uh, I was, I would ask that we table it. I think there is a, a representative here. If anyone has any preliminary questions to ask at this point, um, otherwise, Mr. Mars, do we do it? Do we need to actually table it since it's on the agenda, or can we just hold off on it? Yeah, because it's coming out of a public hearing. If you could table it to a date, certainly. So I'd ask for a motion a second to uh, table it to our first meeting in February. I'll, move, I'll make that motion that we table it Mr. to the first meeting. I'll second. second by Ms. Peters. Any comment or discussion at this point? Please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Chisholm. <coughs> Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Powell. Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you for the consideration. So when I'll return to uh, item A, which is an ordinance amending various sections of the Village of Riverside zoning ordinance relative to gravel drive. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, I would like to uh, make a few comments, Mr. President. Uh, brief comments and a few questions regarding point A. When uh, okay, okay. As soon as we get the motion on the floor. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Um, back in October, well, I guess maybe it was technically September. Uh, during the public hearing for a gravel driveway variation on Barry Point, the Planning and Zoning Commission noted that our code provisions for gravel driveways were uh, somewhat ambiguous um, and unclear. As part of their recommendation on that petition, the commission um, recommended to the village board that the code provisions relative to gravel driveways be clarified and the code be made explicit relative to the ability to maintain gravel driveways going forward. The Village Board uh, considered this variation request and the Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation and tabled the discussion on the variation to the January 16th, 2020 Village Board meeting to allow the Village Attorney to draft a text amendment to clarify gravel driveway regulations. Since that time, a text amendment has been drafted and considered by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, they conducted their public hearing um, on December 16th and there were a number of residents with existing gravel driveways that did speak at that public hearing. The Planning and Zoning Commission ultimately voted 5-0 to recommend approval of the proposed text amendments with certain changes. The original text amendment that went before them um, was based on the village board direction and um, the village board had asked that uh, the regulations 
address um, amortization. So uh, the proposed amendments sent to the commission, uh, drafted by the village attorney and I, uh, removed the standards for maintaining existing gravel driveways, explicitly stated that existing gravel driveways are a non-conforming driveway, clearly stated that the only exception is for decorative pea gravel driveways for homes that are designated as historic landmarks and approved by the village board, and stated that residential gravel driveways, other than those authorized as the historic landmarks, um, must be replaced with a permitted driveway material by January 31st, 2023, giving um, a three-year timeline for people to bring their driveways into conformance. Uh, all the property owners, uh, the property owners of all known existing gravel driveways were notified of the public hearing and several attended the meeting. Um, there was concerns expressed by several of the residents regarding um, cost, um, environmental sensitivity, storm water, um, and the short timeline for bringing into conformance. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission considered all of that feedback and recommended some changes to the proposed text. Their amendments included to allow the existing gravel driveways to remain until the property is sold, to require the gravel driveway to be replaced with an approved driveway material within one year of the sale of the property, to require existing gravel driveways to be maintained to the maintenance standards that are currently in the code, but also to revise the current maintenance standards to only require edging for decorative pea gravel driveways. The Preservation Commission also reviews all zoning text amendments um, to comment on the effect of the proposed amendment on our historic landmark designation and the general plan of Riverside. And these comments are to be submitted to the Village Board. The Preservation Commission reviewed this text amendment at their January 14th meeting. Uh, they reviewed the text amendment and based on the limited number of homes affected and the ability to slowly phase them out, the commission found that the proposed amendments as recommended by the Planning and Zoning Commission would not have a negative impact on our designation. Um, additionally, based on some feedback uh, that staff received, uh, we compiled some additional information which I provided you um, at the dais today. Um, uh, there's a memo from our village engineer regarding the permeability of gravel driveways as well as a survey from some comparable communities. So I asked our village engineer to provide kind of some clarification on whether or not a gravel driveway is considered permeable. Um, and he stated that a pea gravel driveway would be considered a permeable driveway because um, the stone does not compact like it would kind of a, a standard gravel. Whereas sort of your standard gravel driveway, it's made in such a way that it is meant to compact to provide that very solid surface for driving and, and parking on. So whereas a pea gravel would be considered a permeable surface, a traditional gravel driveway would not be considered permeable. Um, he did say if we were to move to allowing pea gravel driveways as a permitted driveway material in general, that we would need to make sure that the entire driveway is excavated down um, as opposed to just sort of top dressing um, like an existing gravel driveway or the ground. Um, because in that case, with that compacted uh, ground beneath it, it would not be permeable. So um, his illustration was that it was the equivalent of putting a colander on top of your countertop. You're gonna pour the water in and it's just gonna spread all over the countertop. It's not gonna soak in um, that way. So that um, is uh, for gravel driveways regarding their, their permeability. Um, additionally, I surveyed some, quickly surveyed some other communities in the area, um, including Brookfield and Western Springs, uh, LaGrange and LaGrange Park. And most of them do not permit sort of your traditional gravel driveway, and they are considered non-conforming driveways, with the exception that um, both Hinsdale and LaGrange do allow the decorative um, stone driveways, so like a pea gravel driveway would be considered a, a permitted paving material for a driveway. Some of the communities um, don't really have any compliance requirements for the non-conforming driveways. Um, they're just kind of allowed to remain in perpetuity. They don't have uh, specific requirements for how they're supposed to be phased in. So, so long as they're maintained, um, you know, they can stay. Um, others, um, it would kind of fall under their typical um, com um, non-conforming status. So if other improvements are made to the property, um, they would need to be brought into compliance. One community said it would be specific to the driveway itself. So if the driveway was just being maintained, it would be fine. But if the driveway needed to be replaced, then it would need to be replaced with an approved driveway material, such as concrete or asphalt or pavers and different materials they have listed in their code. Uh, the other said that really any change to impervious surfaces 
would require increase in pervious surfaces would require that driveway to come into conformance with the proper paved material per their ordinance. So that's kind of um, some of the information about how some other communities in the area deal with gravel driveways and the non-conforming <coughs> aspect of them. So you have an ordinance before you that incorporates the Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation, which again would allow the gravel driveways to remain until the property sells. However, those gravel driveways do need to be maintained to certain maintenance standards. Um, and then it would require that that change happen within one year of the sale of the property. So I'm happy to answer any questions, and I know we have residents in the audience that I'm sure would like to speak. Okay, so first I'd like to ask for a motion a second uh, to approve the ordinance. We can't talk about it until we have a motion. I'll move. And the speakers, second, second Mr. Pollock. Sir, you had some comments, questions for us? I do. I'll be brief. Please uh, take as much time. Some of this some maybe for the work. Take as much time as you, as you like, sir. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you for giving me this time. My name is Tom Holacek. I'm a Riverside resident, have been for most of my life. I went to the meeting back in December, learned a lot about this situation. I am on the non-compliant list. Uh, I have a very small portion of my property that when I moved in back in the 1980s was used by the prior owner as a driveway. I do not use it as a driveway. Uh, there's tiny bits of gravel still there and I was still singled out. So anyway, I asked Ms. Apt um, for a list of the non-compliant uh, current driveways in the village uh, she was very kind and very prompt. She gave me uh, the list. I think there were about 20, 25 uh, properties currently that are on the non-compliant list. As I said, mine is one of them. Uh, I have no issues with the uh, new uh, phraseology, the new um, wording. Um, there's really not much for me to do to be compliant, but I will be compliant within a year. I have a couple questions, though. First of all, um, is that list of 20 some properties, is that supposed to be comprehensive for all of Riverside? For gravel driveways? Yes. yes. All right, I'm here to tell you, you've got a lot of work to do. My wife and I took a walk two blocks, three blocks from our home. We found five glaring properties, glaring, I mean very obvious, meaning they're in the front that are clearly non-compliant that were not on the list. So I mentioned this not to be a pest, but that the problem may be more extensive than you realize. Just in going a couple of blocks from our home, we found five, possibly six properties. Uh, clearly, these are not, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a little parcel. These are, these are driveways, long driveways and such that really make you wonder, well, what's going on with these, okay? So I wanted that to be noted. Sir, okay, so those are gravel driveways? Yes, okay. yeah, absolutely. No, no offshoots, no unique form of gravel, no pea gravel, nothing. It, this is the standard run-of-the-mill compactable gravel that I think you don't want us to have, and they're there. So my recommendation would be that uh, the committee or the board take another look and see um, if there are designated individuals. I don't mean to implicate others around me. I don't want to get people in trouble, but the problem may be more extensive than is thought. Okay. Second question I have, does the village have any property with gravel driveways? Mr. Bailey's not here. Not to my knowledge. Um, might have to look at that again, too. Does Riverside Lawn and Riverside Recreation, do those buildings encompass Riverside properties? Riverside Lawn doesn't. No. The Riverside Recreation Building is which, not? Which, what Riverside? The Riverside Recreation Building across the river there. Across oh, you the, mean the public, the public, the public works? works? Or Public yeah. Works Building, yes. Our Public Works facility is over there. I'm trying to think of where what parcel or there's plenty of gravel over there it may not be right in front of their driveway and their garage area but 
all around there, there's a lot of gravel. So it may or may not be complete. Is it, is is it our, pro within the, our Well, I don't know, fencing. that's why I'm mentioning it to okay. you. I don't know Because our the superintendent extent. is looking very, um, She's staring he, daggers uh, no. behind me or? No, no he, no, he's okay. trying to figure ah. out what, what location. <coughs> if, you, if you want to stop by and show us in particular the area you're referring to. Well, just drive up there. You'll see what I mean. Drive into the facility. I do every day. Yeah. Okay. Well, so it's paved. Need, it is. I mean, it's we paved to a point, and then it's gravel. <clears throat> and I don't know where the boundary, you know, ends and begins. Again, I'm just... Yeah, we have a neighbor. Just let you know. Neighbor, Jason Plus, okay. To our driveway, mm -hmm. west of our driveway. Mm -hmm. um, if you're referring to that area, yeah. No, I, that's that's not technically built property. Okay. Well, I'll take a look tomorrow. I, I just thought of it when I walked in this morning or this <coughs> afternoon, this evening. So just another consideration. I mean, just for sake sake of completeness, completeness, um, I would ask that the board take this into consideration that there may be more properties involved than you think possibly even your own maybe maybe I'm wrong but um, otherwise the new wording you know I can deal with it I'm I'm okay and I want to thank the committee for taking that time to hear us out and to uh, listen to our concerns uh, I think they made some nice adjustments so thank you for hearing me out thanks Mr. Alger. Anyone else like to address the board at this point? Please. Good evening. My name is Mary Slesher, and I live at 128 Berry Point, and I'm one of the um, two who made a, a request for a variance for a shared driveway or budded driveways. Um, and I, I did read the um, amended text that came in the mail, and uh, I think it was very, very well done. Uh, I like that it, it gives, um, we can maintain our driveways until the sale of the property. That's tremendous. I mean, it's, if we're going to put the money in to maintain it, to be able to enjoy it until we sell is, is a very good thing. Thank you to those who worked on this. Um, there is a, a three-year replacement for a driveway. Um, what is that pertaining, pertaining to? That was what staff had originally proposed to the commission. Um, the commission amended that to take the three-year compliance out and put it so that it would be tied to the sale of the home. Oh, okay, so it's thank you. One year of the sale of the home. One year of the sale of the home. All right, thank you. Um, the other thing that, that I'm, I have a question on is it says that um, pea gravel is um, permeable. Um, if we're going to maintain a pea gravel driveway, we need to put more pea gravel on top of it, correct? Otherwise, it won't be, you're shaking your head. Pea gravel on top of other pea gravel? Yes. Or pea gravel on top of regular, normal, non-pea gravel? on top of pea gravel. The driveway is pea gravel. It needs to, to be brought into compliance with um, how many inches of pea gravel are there. Two inches. Right. Okay. So can we just add more pea gravel on it or, or must we excavate? I don't believe so that your gravel is a pea gravel driveway. Oh, it's not? That, that no, it's not pea gravel. No, I don't think so. Okay, so we can just use the same kind? You'd have to use the same kind. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. And I think that's all I have. Um, and I want to thank those who worked on this. Um, AJ and I are the ones who were confused by the, the text. I mean, we, we kept referring us back, and we felt like we were going in a circle. So thank you so much for your work on this, and, and thank you on behalf of other pea gravel owners. Thank you. So just, just for the sake of clarification, there's gravel and there's pea gravel. The, the, the gravel um, that we were just talking about is not pea gravel, it's the, the white gravel that is multiple sizes, has dust. Um, if, if you watch the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, you might have recalled Director Happ said that to the best of her knowledge, the reason this 
the, this uh, prohibition against gravel driveways was put in originally uh, was because of public health concerns, because of the dust that is created by your typical crushed gravel driveway, which is not an issue with pea gravel driveways. So just so that we're all thinking in terms of the same, mm -hmm. same substances here. Other comments at this point, or should the trustees have a run at it? Okay. Trustees, what, what do you think? I have a question. Um, why has, why was the determination made that pea gravel can only be used for designated historic landmarks as opposed to all homes? I think the distinction was made at the time um, based on, I think, Plan Commission and Preservation feedback that they didn't want to make the local landmarks that had existing pea gravel driveways have to remove them. Um, they felt that it was part of their designation and they should not be required to, to remove them. So I believe the language was written to reflect that our local landmarks would be allowed to, to keep and maintain a, a decorative pea gravel driveway. Um, why don't we allow non-historic homes to use pea gravel? That is how the code was written at okay. that time. So it's not been vetted by, that question hasn't necessarily been vetted by the Preservation Commission or? Correct. Okay. It just, it feels a little bit like that designation is why they're getting to use the pea gravel and that, that mm -hmm. seems to be, if pea gravel is permeable, I could see people wanting to use it if it is a cheaper option, um, but maybe they don't have the designation. Mm -hmm. Right, so just something to think about. Unless we have an issue with pea gravel in general, we don't want too much of it around for some reason. Well, I mean, I guess from a maintenance perspective, you know, your pea gravel is decorative and it's around and it's permeable, so it doesn't lock. Mm -hmm. So you have to have your edging on it, and it's still going to kind of squish and move mm -hmm. and things like that. So, I mean, it's it, again, if we would allow for it, it would be a homeowner preference, but the maintenance there and um, the ability to remove snow and things like that is going to be different than it would with your sort of standard uh, paved driveway. So if that is a direction that the village wants to go, um, you know, we can explore that, um, providing for that for that option. Um, I mean, I understand are, maybe, you know, most people may not want it right. for those reasons, but I could see if someone wanted to do a something that is more environmentally friendly, but not do the permeable pavers, which are very expensive. This could be an option for them, but they don't have that option unless they have a designated historic land. Right, as point. the code yeah. is written. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I, I have a similar position as Liz. Um, and I actually think it might be more expensive once you include the maintenance, but I think that like, as a homeowner, if, you, if, if the historical homes are able to have the pea gravel, which I think is beautiful, but that's my own opinion, right? Someone else might hate it. I think we might want to explore the idea of giving other homeowners the opportunity to design their driveways the way they want to do it, especially since it could potentially be green. And um, I think you have to have some maintenance restrictions in there from an edging perspective, so it doesn't right. overflow. Mm -hmm. But look, you know, one of the best things about Riverside is all the uniqueness of the different homes, and those can also be related towards the driveways and giving a homeowner the chance to design their driveway the way they want it. To me, seems logical. I would concur with that with that as well. I mean, it's part of being green. We want you know this whole green push. So I would like non historical homes to have that option of having pea gravel as well. So I have a question for you then, Mr. Mars. Um, <clears throat> two questions. One, uh, if Mr. Holacek is correct that we have missed homes that have gravel driveways, um, is there a notice issue? Because I, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, we directly notify everybody on our list we tried to about, about tonight's meeting and discussion. Right. Okay. So, um, because this would affect anybody who has a gravel driveway, do you see any, any have any concerns? Uh, it, 
Not necessarily. I mean, we're, we're trying to extend the time beyond what was uh, originally in the code or arguably in the code. Um, <coughs> uh, I mean, we could follow up with a, having staff do a comprehensive, you know, drive around and, and try to see if, if they did indeed miss them and, and uh, let them know. I, and what, I, I'm not concerned because we're not setting a specific time limit that's coming up, but I guess uh, down the line you would want to make sure that your list was complete. It, in the alternative, if you did feel like you wanted to give those people notice, uh, you could delay a vote on this until you had a chance to go around and see if anybody was missed. So the second question is, if we, if we wanted it on, on page 197, <coughs> of the packet where we have a list of permitted and prohibited driveway materials. If we wanted to alter that list, say either to add to allow pea gravel driveways to non-landmark homes, or if we wanted to uh, add some language that specifically tried to incentivize or recommend uh, pervious asphalt or pervious concrete, is that something that we can do based on the the extent of the plan and zoning public hearing and discussion. Yeah, so we wrote the public hearing notice intentionally broad in an attempt because we didn't know exactly how things were going to play out. So it does talk about uh, revi revising and or clarifying permitted driveway materials and regulations uh, related to gra gravel driveways. Um, if you wanted to utilize that to to make amendments to that list of permitted materials, you could, understanding that it wasn't something that the plan commission specifically looked at, but it is within your, within the notice and, and within your power. Okay, so, having heard that, do you, do you have concerns about proceeding with this this evening? Absence, maybe trying to do a little more look at the extent of the issue, Mr. Popper? Um I do. Um, I would want to hear from the Planning Commission in their opinion on allowing uh, pea gravel driveways as a generally permitted uh, structure in the village. Um, I, I, I'm not inclined to be for it or against it. I'm open to it, but I certainly want to have their opinion because they were not asked that question. In fact, being at the hearing, I think they felt like they shouldn't be commenting on that because they were only asked to comment on the status of non-conforming driveways. So I understand it may be legal and proper to go ahead and do that, but I, I would like to have the benefit of their review of that before we did anything. And in addition to that, I think there'd be a number of standards that would have to be parsed out. I don't think we'd want to just say pea gravel driveways are permitted. We would want to specify whether or not they have to have the plastic undergrad and the edging and how deep it should be and things like that. So we need engineering input as well as planning and zoning. Is that is that specified? I agree with you, but is that, is that specified in the historical requirements? Um, currently, no. It's just the standards as they're in there about it being um, the proper depth, evenly done, the steel edging. Um, we might be able to reuse that. Um, you know, it doesn't really talk about the underlayment or anything like that in the current standards. So. President Sells? Yes. So, so one may, way possibly to address both items then is to remand this matter back to the Planning Commission for consideration of these specific issues and in the meantime have staff do it, uh, see if they can update the list. So before we just do that, let, let's, let's have a little bit further, further conversation about it so that if we have any other questions that we want Planning and Zoning to, to look at, but let's make sure that we only have to remand this once. Um, I mean, my concern, I, I agree with the, the idea of having, allowing people to use the, the, pea, the pea gravel with proper uh, installation. I do think it's important, as Mr. Jacobs mentioned, <coughs> that it furthers our sustainability efforts. It also furthers our stormwater management efforts. Um, the only thing that I'm, I'm, I have a little bit of trouble with is tying the necessity of redoing these existing crushed gravel driveways to the sale of the house. Um, I would favor something that would say, 
either the three-year period that was originally suggested by staff or the sale of the house, whichever comes first. Because I think there is a, a public interest in trying to uh, move these crushed gravel, crushed gravel driveways into conformity in a reasonable amount of time instead of something that could be you know, decades in the making if it's tied to the sale of the house. So I don't know what your thoughts are about that. Mr. Bob? I, I, I think that there's two completely separate issues here. One is the desirability and whether or not we want to amortize crushed gravel driveways. To me, that's a completely different question than whether we want to allow pea gravel driveways. Absolutely, yeah, right? completely different. So, right. in order for me to decide what the best course of action would be for crushed gravel driveways, I would want that updated survey. I want to know how extensive this issue is. I would also feel like I was at the Planning and Zoning Commission and in tonight's discussion, obviously, and I don't feel like I've gotten a good detailed explanation of the pros and cons or of crushed gravel driveways. I hear that they create dust. Well, how much dust? How much of a problem is that really? Uh, I hear that they are maintenance issues. I don't know what that means. Does that mean they're unattractive or does that mean other things? I've also heard, I didn't hear this come up when in the Planning and Zoning Commission, I've heard that snowplow drivers don't like it because the gravel gets into the street and, and, and it clogs the sewers and things like that. So I would, I'd like to know more about how bad crushed gravel is for in an urban environment like this. And I think that would uh, inform me as to whether or not they should be amortized or just grandfathered, period, and allowed to go on indefinitely. Um, and then as far as the pea gravel, as I said, I think we just need more information on how it might be done. And if, and I should say too, uh, is the pea gravel, can it be easily contained on the property? Is Are there problems in other villages, other places where maybe it gets spread out and it, becomes a nuisance to the neighbors or in the in the gutter of the street and things like that. So so in terms of what we want planning and zoning to consider then, we're talking about the pros and cons of crushed gravel um, and then the desirability or not desirability of allowing pea gravel on non-landmark homes. Are those are those the two issues? Is there anything else that you want them to look at? When is the next the next meeting? Uh, Wednesday. Well, I'll see. Well, and the next that one will, for that will be February 26th, I want to say. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the crushed gravel part is going to require staff mm -hmm. research. Does that give you an, uh, the reason I'm asking this is because if we're going to table this, we need to table it to a date certain. Right. So, what? We should be able to get ready by then. Yeah by the February PZC. Mm -hmm. okay. So is that the right way to do it, Mr. Mars, to table it until? No, you would, you're would. you actually remanding it back to Planning and Zoning Commission uh, for consider further consideration of these particular issues. And then it will just happen when it happens and then come back to us? Well, no, we should, we should set the date so people can continue to follow the matter who are interested. So uh, if you, if you do February 26th and for some reason uh, additional time is needed, the plan, Planning and Zoning Commission can continue it at that date and let people know. So the motion would be to, to remand for consideration at the February 26th PCC meeting? Yes. And, and just to clarify the, the things that you're looking at, I understand you said too the possible expansion of the permitted materials to allow pea gravel for more than historic homes. Right. Um, pros and cons of crust gravel, but there was also some talk about uh, further further dissection of this date certain versus the. Well, but I don't. But the that they've already they've okay. already reached a decision on right. They okay. they opted for the tying it to the sale yeah. date. Um, the only other thing that I, I I would like to see added to this language is something that that states a village preference for uh, pervious asphalt and pervious concrete. 
is that something that they need to, to discuss as well? Not to require it, but to express a preference for it. Sure, if you want that added to the, to the ordinance language. Right. And then I, we'll, 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 I think this one that wants to talk to, but, okay. but one, one last thing is that, is pea gravel the same as like a washed river rock? I mean, are there other materials that are permeable or represented as permeable? That might be good to find out as well. Mm -hmm. Other than pea gravel, I have no idea, yeah. but is, is there other, are there other alternatives that we may want to include in there that historic homes aren't using, that ordinary homes could? Right. And then that's something else. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Sorry. No, no, it's yeah. Hi, my name is Paul McNerland, uh, 79 Groveland Avenue. Uh, driveway outlaw, I guess, at the point. Um, <laughs> but trying not to be. Uh, I just wanted to uh, reiterate a point of order or uh, just information. I was at the last meeting and I thank you all for the really thoughtful work on the amendment and that's all good and everything. Uh, the th one thing I wanted to bring up, there were a lot of very heartfelt stories here about the, uh, the cost. I mean, I'm a new resident and I've upgraded my gravel driveway uh, thinking I was bringing in compliance. I dumped five grand worth of gravel in. <laughs> it's a brand new gravel driveway. Um, but besides the point, there were a lot of other people who had been in their homes like 30, 40 years, uh, you know, grew up here and are, you know, I, I can't speak totally for them, but it sounded like they were in very hard times. And redoing like a, a hundred foot driveway in another material from the ground up would be devastating. And I think that was the uh, the the shift to um, change with the sale of the home and give that person a, a chance to retire or end their you know time to reside in their home as it is without incurring any you know, like devastating costs. And that's all I wanted to bring up. So, thank you. I mean that's 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 a very good point. And um, and my only thought, of, and I was thinking about that when I prior to what I, I suggested. But I think the countervailing point there is that if the buyer knows that he or she is gonna to have to do this renovation to the driveway, they're certainly gonna take that into account in terms of what they're willing to pay for the house. So I'm not really sure whether, how that balances out in terms of the impact on the current owner, because they're either gonna to have to put the money into the, into the driveway over the next three years, or they're going to have to absorb that hit at the sale of their house. So I, that I think that's just another that's another balancing point to to consider. Right, but if it's if, it's, if you've been in that house for a, a number of years, it's either paid off or you've um, uh, you can take the hit on the uh, driveway just because of inflationary nature, inflationary. Value of property. So, I mean, if you bought your house in like, in like 75, I think you're going to be fine if you take a hit on like, you know, 20 grand on uh, new asphalt or whatever. I, I don't think uh, uh, someone moving in, someone moving in definitely has more capital to invest anyway. And if they know they're going to come in to a house that has a gravel driveway, well, they're probably going to do the kitchen too. They probably know what they they're have coming that's into it. Mm -hmm. So, that's all. Thank you. Uh, you said 20 grand. Sorry, just want to, for our own and for public's knowledge, like what would, a typical, and maybe this was talked about at the meeting, and I, I just I didn't actually get to watch it. A typical hundred foot driveway. Just so happens I priced all this out <laughs> a little while ago. Uh, my driveway itself is 130 feet long, and uh, I'm kind of glad I don't shovel it all because that's a lot. But it came out to about 26,000 and change for permeable pavers. So I want to do a nice job and everything, and that's you know, um, it's, it's like sub nine foot right around. Not totally sure, but it's a it's not a wide driveway. Mm -hmm. um, so about twenty, and I think it was. Ugh, I can't remember the cost on like concrete and other the other ones, but the high end was like twenty six. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. President Sells, please. We some of us recall from our discussion about concrete sidewalks that concrete <laughs> is about seven dollars a square foot. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm Exposed aggregates a lot more. Pardon? Exposed aggregates a Exposed lot more. Exposed aggregates a lot more, but concrete, I think, is running about seven dollars a square foot. Yeah. Asphalt would be cheaper, obviously. Anything else you can think of? Do you have this all in hand, Mr. Mars? And 
Ms. Apt, as to what we want them to look at? Yes. Okay, so I'd ask for a motion to um, remand this issue to the Planning and Zoning Commission for further consideration at their February 26th meeting. So moved. By Mr. Galagos. Second. By Ms. Peters. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Bob. Aye. Motion carries, and that obviously includes uh, a direction to staff to follow up on what Mr. Holacek had to say and make sure we've got make sure we've got everything that's out there. Um, given given that determination, uh, it seems to me to make sense that we should table the next item. B, yeah. Um, but how, because we don't really know when we're gonna. Right, so assume if, if the Planning and Zoning Commission considers your remand in February, uh, that you'll get a report back. Um, so if you wanna table this second, second meeting in March. Is that gonna be an issue for the homeowners? In the meantime, their driveway is right. as is. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I'm not gonna do anything right now. Okay. It would have to be the second meeting in March because that doesn't. That's a very short turnaround. If they're meeting on the 26th and we're meeting on March 5th, so that would be March 19th. So I ask for a motion and a second to table item B until our meeting on March 19th. So moved. On Mr. That Galagos. Second. By Mr. Gisa. Discussion? <clears throat> please call the roll. I had a question. Yes, please. So then would it be up for discussion or it'll be a new ordinance for us to consider? Uh, which? Well, we're, Are we talking about A or B? Um, a. Um, yeah, the, it'll, it'll come back with language suggested by the Planning and Zoning Committee commission in a new ordinance. Right, Mr. Morris? Right. There, there's a so, question. So, so the the gravel driveway portion was remanded back to plan commission. Mm -hmm. A was, and that's going to come back as new ordinance incorporating whatever they do. What President Sells is talking about now is the original variation request in B, uh, which how you act on that in part is going to depend on how the gravel driveway thing turns out. So the thought was to table that uh, to the March meeting until you get the gravel driveway recommendations back. So we'll basically have these two items before us again on March 19th. All right, okay, please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Powell. Aye. Motion carries. And I just want to say to the folks that, that are being impacted by this, um, I know that this is kind of a roller coaster and it's like we're jumping and stopping, but we want to make sure we get it right and we want to make sure that we take all of your considerations into account. Um, and we're getting ready to have five inches of snow tomorrow, so I don't think anybody's going to be working on their driveways <laughs> at this point. But uh, we'll get this all straightened out before spring for sure. So thank you for your patience. We appreciate it. Um, we have no considerations, no new business. There's no need for an executive session, so I ask for a motion and a second to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. By Mr. Galagos. Second. Second by Mr. Gisa. Please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Gisa. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Powell. Aye. Motion passes. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you and good night.